Jeremiah chapter number 2. We're going to begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Now, these two verses, well, verse number two especially, often quoted as a indictment, an admonishment, as a plea that we return to what we once were. Not in action, because he took us out of the miry clay. He doesn't want us to return to where we were when we first found him. It's a call to return to the way that we felt when he first found us. It's a call to return to that appreciation, that adoration, that state of absolute and total goo-goo eyes for God. When you first got saved and everything was brighter, that even on a drear day like this, you'd be like, well, the sun's up there somewhere behind them clouds. Right? You remember when you used to be like, now you wake up. I woke up and there was some crinkling going on. It was just a wrapper, but it sounded like the hail that was falling down yesterday afternoon. And I was like, man, it's coming down out there. I thought it was hitting the window. No, it was just somebody throwing something away in the garbage. Right, but that was my first thing. I said, oh, no, man, it's sleeting out there again. Right, what is it? Well, I'm a pessimist, and I always assume the worst. So then it can only get better from there. Right? It's a surprise either way. Right, well, that's not forever, but certainly spiritually we ought not be that way. Certainly spiritually, you know, with faith, we should have no fear. Now, are we going to have moments where we do feel fear? Yeah, it's not a sin to have the emotion. It's a sin to act on it. It is a sin to act without faith. We're human. We're flesh. Flesh didn't get saved. Flesh doesn't like uncertainty. Flesh doesn't like the idea that in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown, that means there's no effort been put in to ensure that there's a harvest. They were leaving not only everything they knew in Egypt, that was bondage. I mean, you all remember the older crowd that didn't get to see the promised land? They said, we were better off than slaves. They wanted to kill Moses, turn around, and go back into captivity. But there were some that understood, no, 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 no. What God has for us is better. We didn't do any labor for it. Right? We're just walking. We have no idea where we're going still. We got to wait for 40 years for these stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart that didn't want to do what God said to, you know, pass away in the wilderness so that we can enter into it. But we believe that there's something better over there. Well, how did they get that when thou wentest after me in the wilderness? Doesn't say that they followed him. Because you can be dragged, but that's not going after something. You can be coerced into going, that's not going after something. You can be guilted into doing something. That doesn't mean that you're going after him. Right? There are some people that the Holy Ghost they feel, drags them to church every Sunday morning. They're not going after him. That's a sense of obligation. There are some that will say, oh, well, what will people think if I don't show up? Who cares what people think? What would God think? I mean, it's one of the verses out there on that, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, or ourselves together. What's that mean? That God put us here, so if the doors are open, we ought to be here. I mean, when we taught on that, first paragraph, having been led as we believe by the Holy Spirit. When you joined the church, you made a profession that said, I believe it's the will of God for me to be here. Well, what that verse means is, well, if we believe that God wants us to be here, we're going to be here. That's not, you know, a service. That's, that's just bare minimum requirements. You don't get a paycheck unless you show up for work. Right? You don't get to fellowship with God if you don't show up and worship Him. Why? Because there is now enmity or iniquity between you got unequal dealing. That's not going after Him in the wilderness. Going after Him meant that that big pillar of smoke that went before Him by day and the pillar of fire that went before Him by night or the pillar of cloud. That, if it was tall enough, everybody could see it. Right, you, know, you, you ever study out how many Israelites came out of Egypt? It wasn't like ten. It's millions. That pillar was big enough that all could see it. 
And when the pillars stopped, they stopped and they put up camp. And if you study out the way that the camps were arranged by the 12 tribes, it made, if you were to look at it from top, you know, from the sky, if we took one of them drones that they have nowadays and they get all them aerial shots, if you'd have flown a drone up in the sky, it would have looked like a cross with the tabernacle right, the tabernacle right in the middle. But was it? They were going after something that they didn't even understand. They knew that one day God would send his son. That was promised in Genesis chapter number 3. They knew that God had promised Abraham that he'd make out of him a great nation, a chosen people. They knew that God changed Jacob's name to Israel because he wasn't interested in the supplanter or the schemer. He was interested in those that wanted to be called by his name, the children of Jehovah. They went after him because they just believed that God would do all the things that he had promised to do. They weren't guilted into it. Well, y'all remember when I parted the Red Sea? Y'all owe me. Is that how God deals? God does because he loves. Go back to Genesis chapter number 1. When he breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul, God did that in an act of love. Why do you think Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world? Because he loved man enough before he made man to be willing to die for the sin that he knew man would commit. The plan was put into action before he even made man. What's all I say? That's love. These people went after him in the wilderness when it didn't make sense, when they didn't know where their next meal was going to come from, where every morning they had to take just the manna that was going to feed them for that day, or just the quail that was going to feed them for that day, unless it was Friday, in which case they were allowed to take two days' worth because they weren't supposed to labor on the Sabbath. They were supposed to keep it holy. What is that? That's faith. Doesn't matter how much is still left on the ground. I'm taking what I need today. And I'm going to have faith that God's going to send me tomorrow what I need for tomorrow. Amen. They went after him. That means sold out. They left everything behind. They left Egypt with all the gold and riches and livestock and animals and everything else. But it didn't mean anything to them. Because what they wanted was God. When they were in bondage, they didn't cry out for livestock. They didn't cry out for gold or for precious gems or for fine raiment. They cried out in their captivity for their God to return. To bring them out to be where they are supposed to be. You know why they ended up in captivity? Because the generations had to sow the evil that they're ancestors had done but what was that evil they sold Joseph into slavery sin does carry itself out to the third and fourth generation because of that wrong Joseph ended up in Egypt and was able to help his brethren he forgave them fellowship was restored I mean Israel leaned on his staff and worshipped when he found out that God had provided a place for him in the middle of that famine but they were paying the price and they say, you know what, Lord? Our ancestors were wrong. They didn't care what you wanted. They were just jealous of the one that had it better than them. Return to us. We desire you more than we desire the name or the tribe or freedom. We just want you. So when they got to the wilderness, some of them remembered those stories. Remembered what God had done in the past. And they said, even though we were born as slaves, even though we were raised as slaves, even though we thought for the rest of our lives we were going to be slaves, I'm just going to follow God because he did for me what I could not do for myself. Amen. That's why Joshua and Caleb said, nah, we can whip all them giants. God's on our side. Isn't that what Moses said when he came down off the mountain and all them people started worshiping idols again? They said, who's on the Lord's side? They said, well, if God be for us, who can be against us? Even though that verse hadn't been penned down yet. That's what they said. If God's in it, look at the grapes. Look at the land that flows with milk and honey. Look at this bunch of grapes. They had to string it between two of them to carry it. I ain't never seen grapes that big. And I'm not even talking about the size. The size of the grapes might have been the same. But the whole bushel was so big they had to carry it. Can you imagine buying one of them from Kroger? Most of us ain't got cars big enough to be able to take it home. Yet God said, you didn't have to sow. I've already prepared the land for you. They just sought after him. They forsook all and followed him. But we're not in the wilderness in Jeremiah chapter number 2. 
We're in the promised land. They've already received Canaan. They've got cities. One by the name of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem, the very city of God, as people call it. Because they knew that that's where God resided. Because Solomon was allowed, after David had set aside the material, to build the greatest edifice that's ever been built for one purpose and one purpose, a purpose alone, to worship and give God glory and recognition. To do as God said and try to follow after him. What were they doing? They were just trying to win after him or go after him. Solomon said, who cares what else we could use this gold for? Who cares about those cedars of Lebanon that we use to do the beams in the building? Don't care how much we could have got for them. They're God. All the silver plates, all the precious vessels. I mean, if you study that, you know how big those menorahs or those lanterns, as they call them, how big they really were? Roughly the width of a man's arm span. Well, at that time, what was it? I don't know. But let's just say five and a half feet of solid gold. You know how it, that would have fetched a pretty penny back in the day. But what were they saying? We don't care about the gold. We care about doing what God instructed us to do. And then they had spares in case something happened to the one that was lit and was burning. They had a bunch of extra ones so that if that one went out, they had the extras. Just gold sitting in the corner. They didn't care about it. What did they care about? God. But here, this Israel, they've forgotten about God. Oh, sure, they know that God exists. They go by the temple. There are a lot of people that will tell you that God exists because they drive by churches all the time. There's a lot of people that will tell you that God exists because something happened to a family member and, well, only God could have done that. But very few people remember the kindness of their youth. Remember the love of their espousals. I mean, we could have stopped at verse number 2. Go and cry into the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee. That's enough to have revival on. I mean, as I read that, you know what verse came to my mind? I told Job, I knew thee in the belly. God formed us in the womb, because only God can give life. He knew us when we were created, and then at some point, he never forgot about us. But he let us know, I remember you, Brian. He came to you and he said, I, I made you. And I know where you're at right now. I remember who you are. I knew you before you were even made in the womb. I saw you through the omnipotence and the omniscience of God. That I knew exactly where you'd be. I knew exactly what you'd be involved in. I knew what it was going to take to save. And I remembered you when I was on the cross. I remembered you in the Garden of Gethsemane when the devil was trying to kill him there. And he's praying that God give him the strength to make it to the cross. He remembered us as he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount and said, oh, that's going to be great for Christian here one day. That's the verse that he's going to need. But everything that Christ did, he remembered us in it. Everything that God's done since the beginning, he remembered those that would come after. That's the only thing that you'll find in the Bible. I had a conversation with somebody this week on this. It's the only time you're going to find the word predestinate in the Bible is that God knew that some would get saved and it was predestined that they would be conformed to the image of His Son. God didn't say that some would automatically die and go to hell, that there was no chance for them, but He said if you do get saved, it is that you're going to walk as Christ walked. That's the will of God. That's what was predestinated. Well, how do you conform to the image of Christ? You forsake all and you go after Him. Isn't that what he told the rich young ruler? Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, take up that cross, follow me. What's that? It's forsaken all and going after him. If the rich young ruler would have forsaken all in his heart before he came to Christ, Christ wouldn't have told him to sell it. Because he would have known that I'm just going to give myself to Christ. Christ already has everything that I own. When we forsake all, we go after. Israel did at one point. But here, they have not. God remembers back when they were. God remembers the things that they vowed unto God in their youth as a nation, maybe as individuals. That they were God's people. 
mean, God remembers that he did write down that we are a called out people, chosen generation, that we're in the world, but we're not of the world, that we're supposed to be separate. He remembers when we purpose to do that in our own hearts, and he remembers how we may have strayed from that. But you know what he says? He says, I remember when he promised me that. But here's the good news. I never could conform myself to the image of Christ. I never could do what God wanted me to do in the arm of flesh because the arm of flesh will fail me. I never could do what God wanted me to do under my own intellect. Lean not on your own understanding. Ask of the Lord. Lean on Him. Why? Because His ways are above our ways. They're above finding out. I mean, didn't Jesus say, you know, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall... What, what, was, what were we going to find? What were we going to receive? Things that are beyond even our imagination. Things that go so far beyond, not just maybe the complexity or the timing of God. Try and, try and figure out the timing of God. That you were exactly where you were the day that you heard the message that you needed to hear in order to understand that you need a Savior to get you to an altar so that you'd accept. Explain the timing of God. And yet people are worried about the coronavirus. I mean, as I'm reading his verse, he says, I remember the kindness of thy youth. You remember? I mean, you can look around some of these kids. Some of them turn into little goblins. But real young kids... They're just sweet. They don't know things like mine. Right? The purest children, they share. It's not a problem. Oh, you want this? Yeah. You want to be friends? It, there's sincerity there. Why do you think Christ said to suffer not the little children to come unto them? Because chances are, they're more willing to believe God than most adults. And in that youthfulness, the kindness of the well, yeah, Lord, you can have it. I mean, yeah, the Lord's kind to us, but you ever think that maybe He wants us to be kind to Him? He did say, take my yoke upon you. That means we, we hooked up together. You ever been paired up with somebody on the job that you can't stand? That everything they do is about how everything that you do is wrong and everything that they do is right? There's a lot of Christians that live that way. Not with other people, with God. But Lord, why'd this happen? Why'd you have to go and do this? Well, I don't want to go talk to that person. But there was a time that, well, of course, Lord. You only saved me. I'm only bought with a price. My life's no longer my own. You know, I've been besought to present my body a living sacrifice, which is my reasonable service. Of course I'll go do it. Not begrudgingly. Not out of guilt feeling like that God's going to strike me down with a hammer no out of kindness not just towards God towards others show me where Christ somebody that came to him earnestly seeking to hear the truth that he ever treated him with anything but love and kindness I mean I'm convinced we don't have chapter and verse on it it's a little bit of theology according to Jordan I'm convinced that he went to those money changers before he drove them out with the whip because first he was filled with righteousness and he was over there. He had to make the three quartered whip. He was pondering on it. But I'm convinced that he went over there and said, Hey, y'all know that y'all not be doing this? He might have taught on it. I mean, you always find him in the synagogues teaching. He might have taught on it that morning. They may have heard him and just gone, Pfft. I'm convinced that he gave them kindness first, and when they rejected it, then the whip came. He said, Well, why is that? Because God is long suffering, His mercy endureth forever. He is love. Certainly he did it for their betterment. Certainly he did it for the betterment of those that were coming and just expecting that they'd be able to find the sacrifice that they were supposed to procure, raise, or sometimes even keep at their house so that they would have a sacrifice when they needed to return them to the kindness of their youth. But then, the, one that, the part that a lot of people talk about, the love of thine espousals. What was that? Well, that's when you fall in love and you say... I want you for the rest of my life. That's an espousal. You know the word spouse? Espousal? What's that mean? You stuck with them for the rest of your life. But we're not stuck with it. We get the pleasure of spending all eternity with them. We just sang the song about it. Amen. Yes. That 
eternal morning where he is the light of the city. Well, there's going to be one of these days, there's a new one coming. It's got 12 foundations. It's got gates made out of a single pearl. Explain that. I don't know. It's a big pearl. Don't know where God got that claim from, but he had a fish big enough to swallow Jonah. I'm convinced he can take care of it. Right? Glad. Glass-like streets that are so pure gold that they're clear. Explain that. I don't know. God can do it. That's the cheapest thing in heaven is gold. It's a good thing, too. I don't like yellow, yellow gold. I think it looks, I don't, it's just a thing. I don't know what it is. don't know what it is. I just don't like it. I'm glad they're going to be clear streets. The Lord knew what he was doing. God doesn't like yellow gold either. He likes clear gold. There you go. Let's think on that for a while. The only reason he likes silver is because when he gets pure enough, he can see his reflection in it. What's that? That's us going after him and saying, all right, Lord, put me in the fire seven times and refine me. Why? Because we love him enough that we want to be like him. Y'all remember, for those of y'all that are married, I, I read, I don't know, but I read. Then you know, God made Adam and Eve, made Eve out of the rib of Adam. Then the Bible tells us that Man and woman become one flesh. They become one in the eyes of God. A help meet for one another. That they are complete in one another. Y'all remember when you used to look at people and say, man, I wish I could have that part of you. You're, you are what I'm not. And I am what you are not. You remember when you loved that the other person was different? Now you hate the fact that they do different things than you. And they want to go places that you don't want to go. And they want to eat at restaurants that you don't like. <laughs> but when you loved it, I love the fact that you're different. didn't matter. I'll go wherever because I get to spend it with you. I'll spend whatever money just for a little bit of your attention for a while. Get away from everybody else just so that it's just you and me. Right? Well, Israel, at one point they loved God. They joined themselves to God. They were called God's chosen people. Still are to this day. God's still going to bless them that bless them and curse them that curse them. Because God remembers His espousals but they don't remember the love of their spouses. Y'all ever realize, you don't realize how much you like something or love something until it, you realize that it isn't what it used to be? For instance, I did not realize how attached I was to a blue Ford 500 until it got rear-ended and I realized it's probably going to be totaled. I like that car. I've been through a lot in that car. It's all-wheel drive. It gets horrible gas mileage, but I can get through anything. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the first car that I ever financed, first one ever paid off. First one that, you know, hey, no payment. It's mine now. Nobody gave it to me. I earned it. Right? Then it's gone. It, get this. I got rear-ended. Trunk's all buckled up. I mean, sitting out there in the parking lot because everybody's home for the holidays, apparently, with the coronavirus, so there's no room to park at the foster house, so I had to bring it out here. Or else I'd have been parking like halfway down the street to get into the house. So I had to clean out the old one. Well, my jail bag it has all the Bibles and tracks and everything that take over to the work camp. It was in the trunk. So I had to open the trunk. I was afraid to open the trunk because I knew the trunk probably wouldn't close again. Well, the uh, trunk won't open at all. So guess who had to lay down the back seats and crawl through the uh, throughway to get things out of the trunk? That would have been a funny sight. But you know what? As I'm doing it, I'm thinking, you know what? God gave me this car when I needed it. He's going to give me a different one. I had my eyes set on a Chevy Impala. But guess what? That sucker sold like literally 10 minutes before I got there. Then I drove another car too small. Like the Goldilocks is just right. That car was not just right. I barely got into it and couldn't get out of it. Even mom said, Jordan, I, I had a hard time getting in and out of that thing. I said, yeah, that ain't going to work. Then she wanted her to go over to the Toyota dealership. No, I'm done. I just want to go home. I'll look at things online. No, let's just go over to the Toyota dealership. The guy says, you ever heard of an Avalon? I said, yeah, there's the big Camrys. He goes, yeah, they're the big Camrys. I said, do they have room? Yeah. And then I said, well, how many miles? What's the price on that one? He told me. I said, nope, see you later. I know my budget. That ain't it. Then he's like, well, just take it for a test drive. And then Dad's like, oh, we'll talk them down. We'll talk them down. We'll talk them down. <laughs> I used to be in sales. We'll take care of this. Then, as I'm driving it, I'm sitting there, you know, I kinda, this thing drives nice. Kind of like this thing. That grew on me. Well, guess what? When I have to start paying payments on it, I'm not going to like it that much. 
What did the car do to me? Nothing. I did it to myself. Right? I was the one that signed on the dotted line and said, but here's the thing. God never changes. Amen. Never has God said, sign on the dotted line, and this is the payment you got to make every month. What was his requirement? Seek my face. Take up that cross death. Follow me. Fellowship with me. Which is why we follow him. Which is why we confess our sins so that there's nothing keeping us from God. It's where we can have that fellowship. Which is why we get in the word. Y'all remember the first time that you really just said, you know what, Lord, I need an answer. I'm clearing the schedule. I don't care what's going on. I'm not picking up the phone. And you get in the word of God. And then them words literally jump off the page in bold. You remember the first time that happened? And you just wanted to tell everybody about it. You're not going to believe what I found in the Word this, this week. What was it? Well, one, it gave you a desire to get back in it. But two, you loved it so much that it changed your life. Just words on it. They'd been there for, oh, I don't know, since either Jesus spoke them or since he inspired somebody to pin them down and write them. They'd only been in that Bible that you had owned since you bought it. But they came alive to you because the Spirit discerned the Word of God and then made it known to you. And you just had a love for it. But how many times since have you read it and it's just, you're skimming over it? You're looking for an answer, but you don't want to put the seeking in. You don't want to put the following after. I mean, I know my, how much God loved you. He loved you enough to lay down his own life, take it up three days later. So that you could be where he was because he could come to us, but we could not go to him. So he came to us where we were. He didn't give us a requirement list that says, well, you have to get here in order to meet me. It wasn't an Uber. I can't get down that street. You've got to meet me on the corner. One of them. No, no, no. I'll come to you. Then it wasn't, well, I'll come to you, but you've got to make your own sacrifice. No, he already paid it. All right, well, you've got to handle the blood of Christ and apply it to your own life. No, no, no. He cleansed me. Well, you've got to keep yourself safe. No, no, no. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I've got a hope that's anchored in the veil. Ain't nothing can change it. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't get unsaved. He's done everything. And yet sometimes we look at our life or maybe things that God's allowed to come into our life and we ask ourselves, well, Lord, why do you hate me? Lord, why'd you allow this to happen? Why'd you allow that hateful person to come into my life? Not understanding that if we just get in here, if we'd spend a little bit of time with them, if we remember the love of our espousals, Remember them verses that helped us get through those bad days. Well, what, what is all of this? Right. I watched a dumb YouTube video this week. I like movies on people that are on anesthesia after they've had surgery. I find them very funny. But one of them, the guy comes out of it, and his wife's filming him, and he goes, who are you? He goes, did the doctor send you in? Because you're, you're a nice piece of eye candy. And then he says, what's your name? She goes, I'm Candace. I'm your wife. He goes, you're my wife? And then by the end of it, it's just him sitting there on the bed going, man, I hit the jackpot. Right? Well, he got to fall in love with his wife a second time. Except he's drugged up and he didn't remember it, so he had to watch the video to find out about it. Do you realize that every day God remakes the promises of the Word of God specifically to you? Daily, he renews his promise. He wakes up, but well, God doesn't wake up because he doesn't go to sleep. When you wake up, at some point between day and day, because with God it's an eternal day, he looks at each one of you and says, I promise to do this. I promise to do that. For instance, I promise that I made you a king that you can enter directly into the throne room of God and make your petitions known to me. Jesus says, I promise to be the mediator between God and man. I promise to make intercession at the right hand of the Father for you. The Holy Spirit promises that when you can't pray, I'm going to take those groanings and utterings and take them to the throne room of God and pray for you. Then he says, I promise, I'm going to be long-suffering today. I promise that my mercies endure forever. I promise that you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you. Amen. The thousands of promises in the Word of God, God remakes every single one of them to you each and every day. But each day we get the chance to fall in love with God again, all over again. Do we take advantage of it? That's up to us. But God said, I remember the love of thine espousal. And let's be honest. If we loved God like God loved us, we'd live different. 
Perfect love casteth out all fear. Isn't that what your Bible says? Perfect love doesn't care about the coronavirus. It's coming to worship God. Perfect love doesn't care about what the traffic or how much construction they're doing on the road work or how cold it is outside or how slick it is. If God opened the doors by you know the grace of God, I'm going to be there. That's what providentially hindered means. It means it takes an act of God to keep you from being at the house of God. God has to allow something to enter your life or orchestrate something in your life that keeps you from being here. He understands that because it's the will of God. But anything else, the love of God would cast out all fear, all doubt. Love for God will seek us, when we're not at the house, seeking his face in the book. Cast out all fear on, well, what's going to happen today? What's going to happen today is what God wants to happen. And I'm going to purpose that I'm going to do what God wants me to do in each of them situations. No, I don't know why I just saw this one too. I saw a video one time. Guy, I think it was their like 50 or something wedding anniversary. Guy's wife is in the hospital. Well, they spend every anniversary. He'd take her to a nice restaurant. He'd get all dressed up in a tux. And, you know, she'd put on a nice dress. And they'd go to a nice fancy sit-down restaurant. And they'd save up all year because, you know, they're on a fixed income they'd save up all year to that one night a year they'd have a really nice dinner well she's in the hospital guess who showed up in her hospital room in a tux with flowers and balloons her husband why because he loved her no matter if it was at a fancy dinner or whether she's in the hospital he said you mean so much to me I'm going to put the tux on I'm going to go get some flowers and balloons and I'm going to show up and surprise you well how many of us wake up every day look at the tux and say, I don't want to put on my best for Jesus how many of us wake up and we see the bouquet? We say, uh, it's got some thorns on it. If I hold it, I might get stuck. There might be some pain involved. Now, I'm not going to blow up them balloons with helium. They're going to deflate eventually. Well, tomorrow, God may give you some more helium. Tomorrow, God may give you some flowers that don't have thorns. Maybe those thorns are actually the thorns in the flesh that are supposed to make us appreciate the grace of God. Because his strength is made perfect in weakness. Amen. Maybe when I put on the tux, people realize, well, hey, he identifies as somebody different. Tay's dad had a retirement party this weekend. They showed me the invitation, the booklet and everything. Her dad put on a Marine Corps uniform. You know what that identifies him as? A Marine. You know what the whole armor of God identifies us as? A child of God. Yeah. You know what love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, you know what all the fruits of the Spirit identify us as? Something different than the world because you don't find those things in the world. You'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. But where's our fruit come from? It either comes from in here or it comes from heaven. My heart's deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. The fruit that comes from my heart, bitter sour people don't want to taste that but it does make them appreciate some heavenly fruit when they get it I've said it before we're supposed to bear fruit so that others can taste and see that the Lord is good if the fruit is of me they're not going to like what they taste but if they get a taste of Jesus they just might they just might want to forsake all and follow after him in the wilderness they might stop caring about well, what this person thinks what that person thinks or maybe even what I think about this situation. I mean, I've wrestled for a long time before I left the law firm. I prayed and asked God for a verse. He gave me the verse and I said, Lord, can you give me a different verse? <laughs> but you know what? Happier than I've ever been. You know who I had to convince? Me. And really, my soul... Deep down in here, it said, hey, we know the answer. Let's go do it. But then my mind said, well, we got to make sure we do it the right way. Right? Well, there is wisdom in that. We're supposed to be harmless as doves, but we're supposed to be wise as serpents. We're supposed to do things to where we're to be blameless before other men. Not for our sake, but for Christ's sake. That they can't look at Christ and say, well, one of yours did me wrong. That's why we ought to desire to live. Ideally, that's how we would live. 
But you know how we live that way? You know how we do the right thing? First off, guidance. Then we got to listen because we are led by the Holy Spirit. How else do you think that yet not I, but Christ liveth in me? How do, you, how do we get there? The Holy Spirit has to live through us. But you know how we stay on track? We just fall in love with them every day. I mean, if I had to title it, it'd be how much do you love God? Do you love God enough to wake up every day and put on your best? Do you love God enough that in hardness you don't react as the flesh would have you react, but you get alone for a second and say, all right, Lord, I need some help on this. In the flesh, I want to go in there and knock somebody's head off. But I know, I'm pretty sure, like 99.9% .9 sure that that's not what you want me to do. So I'm in here praying right now, asking for strength that I don't do that. Give me patience. Give me love for that individual. Well, how do you get love for others? Well, you've got to love God enough to start loving the things that God loves. Because He loves sinners. He loves those that are, in the eyes of other people, unlovable. But God's always loved them, so they're not unlovable. How do we get there? You love someone enough that you start acting like them. You start taking on their qualities. Well, how do we do that? Well, you just love God enough that if you draw nigh to Him, He draws nigh to you. He already made you a new creature. All we have to do is get close enough to Him to allow Him to make us into that creature. He already sees the finished product. It's just me most of the time dragging behind being too stubborn to let God make me into what I know that I need to be. Because right, sometimes it's not convenient. Well, love casteth out inconvenience. Sometimes it's not enjoyable. Well, love understands that maybe a little bit of uncomfort now will mean comfort later. Love understands that he does all things for our benefit. Love understands that, well, temptation's not enjoyable, but in every temptation he makes a way of escape. Doesn't let us be tempted above what we're able to bear. That in all of it, he's right there with us. If you love right, you'll live right. And if you live right, others will understand that you love him. Not because you're Superman. Not because you're anything different than what they are, which is just dirt that God breathed life in, into. But because you understand that I love them enough that I'm going to let him take control. I don't do it. He does it through me. I get out of the way. I try and hide so that people don't see me, but they see him. Because I know how much I don't like myself. I don't expect you to like me, but I do know somebody that you would like. His name's Jesus. And in fact, I dare say you wouldn't just like him. You might love him just as much as I do. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.